Let me uh, introduce Paul. Um, these Zoom use poetry readings, as I've said, have been going on for almost a year, and uh, we've had a wide range of poetry presented. Um, the poetry has usually been intensely personal, and it's often a solace for some very traumatic times in the lives of the poets. But few of the Zoom use poets up to now would call themselves serious poets. Paul Nelson, however, is different. To someone like me, a Canadian, Paul presents himself as brashly American, generous, self-assured, entertaining, and certainly very serious. To give you some background, Paul's professional working career after college began in FM radio, where he was drawn to what was then called long-form programming, interviews that were longer than typical radio fare, up to 30 minutes and perhaps even longer. The analog of this in today's media landscape are what we now call podcasts. Paul eventually developed and syndicated his own interview program for radio in the early 1990s, and these interviews eventually became the book American Prophets. It was in the course of doing these interviews that Paul had the good fortune to interview two very famous American poets, Allen Ginsberg in 1994 and Michael McClure in 1995. And these encounters were, as Paul puts it very simply, life-altering encounters. Ginsburg, and especially McClure, introduced Paul to the idea and style of projective verse. That's a means of poetry composition that the general public first probably saw examples of in the 1950s through the beat poets, where both Ginsburg and McClure were very prominent. Projective verse is described in a famous 1950 essay by the poet Charles Olson, who later was a major figure during the heyday of Black Mountain College, as poetry based on the poet's breathing, and not on the traditional idea of meter or uh, syllables or measuring rhyme or line. The challenge in proje projective verse is to present the breathing through displaying the text on the page in a way that enhances the oral, the sound, and the visual impact. Paul's first major book of verse was, as I understand it, and I could be wrong, I'm sure he'll correct me, A Time Before Slaughter, which was published in 2009 and was just republished last year in a revised edition with the expanded title, A Time Before Slaughter, Pig War, and Other Songs of Cascadia. And the breadth of Paul's causes, activities, interests, and publications go well beyond that one book. I should mention two accomplishments in particular, in the 1990s, Paul founded the Seattle Poetics Lab, <clears throat> pardon me, and the Cascadia Poetry Festival. I did an interview with Paul a week ago to publicize this Zoom News event. The interview is posted on YouTube, and I hope that uh, you've had a chance to listen to it. If not, please do it afterwards. The interview is content rich, to say the least. Teaser interviews for Zoom News events up to this point were usually under 10 minutes. Paul's, Paul Nelson's teaser, however, clocks in at a well-deserved 47 minutes plus. Very entertaining and extremely informative. Now, after saying all this, it's time to let the man and poet himself take the stage. But without further ado, Paul Nelson, take it away. Andrew Hall, what a generous introduction. Thank you for doing your homework. Um, really beautiful to hear that, to hear my life through the kaleidoscope of your uh, perspective and your background as a journalist, it really shines through. Thank you for that. I see it as a very sacred um, task that you took upon yourself. And I'm very grateful for that. That really says a lot about you as a human being. Um, I sit here in front of Lake Washington, um, right next to uh, what many people call as Mapes Creek, what the indigenous people of this area, the Duwamish, knew as Ducks Wukwib. Um, and um, I'm very grateful to be here with my partner, Bhakti Watts. And um, half the time, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Ella Roque Nelson. So, man, I, I watched the Q&A from the last time and it was really wonderful. I really loved it. And so I, I hope for a similar experience today. And um, I'm grateful to be here, grateful for Subud and grateful for everybody taking an hour out of their Friday to listen to my stuff. Um, Michael McClure is uh, an ongoing inspiration. He's got a new book coming out posthumously, uh, May 9th, Mule Cake Blues. I shared a poem 
um, from this book, Jaguar Skies, with him. Look at how, how young he looks. <laughs> Isn't that something? And I, I read it once, I recited it to him one time on the phone, and he was amazed by it, hearing his work back, similar to me hearing my life through your perspective. And it's called Bear as a Star. To be so sensitive to want to run for it and even fear to dash with head thrown back and everything a tremble while desires climb around like ogres in our chests and flash strange needs that lie upon the diaphragm as smothered fires to think the business of the belly governs us when in truth we're smooth and free yes we are lumps and bags of gurgling flesh and beauty freedom loveliness create the mesh that holds us to this surface cliffs in the dawn and shouts of laughter from the street your jeweled hand upon the sheet i remember sitting with michael and his wife amy and michael was like hey recite one of my poems for amy <laughs> And I'll go, uh, okay, you have a request? He says, yeah, do that one you did on the phone the other day. And that was the poem, Bear as a Star, from the mid-70s. The book uh, that you mentioned, Andrew, A Time Before Slaughter, was, in fact, my first full collection. I had a couple of chapbooks. One was called We Don't Celebrate Halloween in Cuba and Other Stories from Auburn. <laughs> and another one was taking a phrase in English, a common phrase, having it translated into Russian and then translated back. It was uh, out of sight, out of mind, and the subtitle, Invisible Maniac. <laughs> those are the two chapbooks that preceded the first real book, and I will not be reading from them. And if you find any of those copies, please destroy them in a ritual fire. Um, Slaughter is the original name of Auburn, Washington, and it's my triggering town. I became a poet in that town, and I'll be forever grateful. And... Um, this tells a little bit of the history. Uh, the, the, the town Slaughter was named after Lieutenant William Alloway Slaughter, but I saw it also as an MO. So not just a town and a man for whom it was named, um, but a way, of, um, a way of dominating, a way of continuing to dominate. And we see this, we see this effort you know, in um, 2021 America, the, the people inspired by the last president doing what they can to maintain a status quo, to deny people civil rights, to have extrajudicial ex executions, and the whole nine, the whole long list of ways that people are slaughtered physically, literally and metaphorically. So this goes to the Japanese American experience in Auburn, and it's called Slaughter's Match. Round midnight, February 26, 1920, a dog barks at an intruder, no one sees. Around midnight, a car speeds off. The barn is burning. The farm is over. Farmers run out with buckets of water, must have dropped them when seeing flames off high-grade cattle. Thomas Christopher's old barn, now the Kosai brothers, now engulfed in flame, now $15,000 of ash. Get out. Deja vu early Monday, January 11, 1926, Buichiro Johnny Itabashi had 74 head of dairy cattle. This was an investment in time, in life, raised from calves, family, secured for the night, no match for the arsonist's hate. Get out. The cows couldn't. January clouds tell the story of souls released. Painful lesson of non-attachment. Cow, cow smoke fills the slaughter sky. Get out. What is the smell of death? Meat clouds brown the slaughter night. Panic in a cow's eye spreads to fill the sky above this particular slaughter of hay and hate and gasoline and yellow men who will not learn. Get out. 74 cows meet their maker, meet their slaughter. Sunday evening at the Buddhist church, Reverend T. Tsumura gave the last rites, neighbors advice, sell the carcasses of those who merely died, those who weren't completely immolated. But since Johnny Itibashi raised these beings, they who served him 
who were confined by him, he discarded that idea as indignant. In the days before bulldozers, 1926, the Nihon Jinkai came out, dug holes, bury the dead, ate a box lunch, and Johnny rebuilt the barn. So that's Slaughter's Match. This next poem goes to the Native American experience, the first people experience in Auburn, Muckleshoot, which was a conglomeration of tribes from around the area put on a reservation shaped in a checkerboard manner where every other square mile was either part of the part of the res or not. A horrible system for wildlife, just horrible. That's what happened. But a great story is um, how um, a settler, how, the, how a descendant of settlers learned the local language, La Seed, and the Southern Puget Sound Salish dialect, Walshoot Seed, and um, saved the stories. In fact, they gave him a ceremonial burning at one of their dinners a few years ago. His name was Arthur Ballard. This is song for Arthur Ballard and includes images from some of the stories he gathered. Born on my mother's birthday. Born in slaughter, October 18, 1876, just this side of Ilauco, two years after the presidential order made the place where you can see all over the res. Old Nelson helped clear his pop Levi's property. Arthur Ballard, born in slaughter to be a transformer, knew Latin, Greek, Espanol y Esperanto, transformed through breath and Wolshoot seed. School teacher, postmaster, secretary, even city clerk, but his real work, transformer. To walk up to the place where he could see all over and listen. Listen to Ann Jack, hear the daylight in graves. Listen, hear the silence of frog woman and eat pheasant with her one good eye here, the land of the dead. Listen to the sound of one gasping after nightfall, calling the realm of the dead, where Raven looks back, does not listen. His meat turns to rotten wood, his stench revealed. Listen to the blood comes out, twa lo ulks, west of Sumner, the menstruating rock, don't drink the water. Listen, this transformer, ha, ha, ha. let us draw breath, see, who is stronger, listen. See the belted yellow hammers, the fart that turns men into crows. Listen to humpback boy, complain about the piece of salmon by the tail, it's not deer gristle. Listen, blanket rock, could have been a marmot. Don't drink the water there, listen. To she who calls the daughter of thunder, she who sees through one bad eye the realm beyond the veil, listen. One child of slaughter, whose work draws breath, changes worlds, enters a pre-settler time, where up is night and down daylight in graves, where Arthur Ballard lives with the daughter of thunder, where people are not people, but snake people, crow people, plant people, medicine people, people the day before, people beyond, where bells are not a crime, where land is in common, where shakers sing, where Arthur Ballard shares bread with old Nelson. Listen, and you can hear the fire in rocks, the blood in trees, the silence of the time before slaughter. So you told me, you said something about me being very serious, quintessentially American. So I'm going to do my best to destroy that myth by reading American sentences. I wish Halima Collingwood were here because she loves the American sentences and maybe she'll buy a copy of the second edition, which is due out from Apprentice House later this year. And I hope to God I can do a reading in public. In fact, I wanna do one on my 60th birthday on September 22 at Open Books at the All Poetry Bookstore. I'm hoping they say yes to that and that we have a nice reading, sign books and go out and have sake and sushi after. So I'm gonna read some uh, American sentences. And these are all from the second edition, going to be in the second edition. So I've not read them before. Certainly I didn't read them last time at my Zoom use. And I have them all here on a document. So I'm just going to read from that. Um, February 26, 2016. Closed caption at Republican debate. Unintelligible yelling. April 14, 2016. 
My life flashed before my eyes. It was better than I had remembered. October 24th, Chinese translation. Please urinate with precision and elegance, which is always good advice. December 11th, how long before an eaten cuticle becomes cuticle again? December 27, what kind of karma do you get from punching a Tibetan prayer wheel? <laughs> True story, that was in BC when our battery gave out on the ferry. January 7, 2017, News Thump says Donald Trump to be sworn in on Book of Carpet Samples. May 28th, if you're looking for a bathroom in a dream, you'd better not find one. December 3rd, this morning I can't distinguish between car alarm and tinnitus. February 1st, 2017, Ikea's founder died, took three hours to assemble his coffin. February 24th, 2018, Sam in his end years, two parts tobacco and one part albuterol. July, June 19th, 2018, there are more guns in the US than people and of higher caliber. July 30th, 2018, apocalypse glossary words, fire nado, pyrocumulus, and this one's for Subud people, January 5th, 2020, octogenarian's latihan sounds, let me try that again, octogenarian's latihan sounds like practice to be a ghost. So those are some American sentences, 17 syllable poems. Um, that are written every day in the manner of Allen Ginsberg to capture the shadow of the moment. I write one every day and be careful what you say because I don't have mine yet for today and they're often they're often found poems. So I will quote you, um, but uh, unless you ask me not to. Um, so I have half of mine to share the screen. I'm going to read a couple of postcard poems. You know what? I'll have them ready and if people want to see the, the image that I created, these two um, come from the August Poetry Postcard Fest, which um, has been going on this year, be 15 years. Last year, we had four, 544 people from 11 countries, 46 states, and three Canadian provinces. And um, you get on a list and you send poems to everybody on your list by the end of August. And uh, I've been creating my own, which is so much fun, so much fun to get out of your head and be able to do this. And so I'm going to read two from the fest last year. And one of them was from uh, was about Lee Konitz, who uh, was part of the Birth of the Cool, the Miles Davis session, 1949, 1950, 1951, and uh, Chicago guy. Postcards from the pandemic sent to Jody Dills of Shoreline with an epigraph from Wanda Coleman. He was last seen at the corner of Birdland and Nevermore. Lee Konitz died today, joining Miles and Lenny Tristano in Birdland's nevermore green room trading eighths and this is how pandemic hits me i guess grief's safety valve leaking out souls like an alto solo refuses to be bird but yet still bop and the, the birth of the cool loses its last miles didn't care he was white and postcards from the pandemic called as you say it to gail Gelkin of Irvington, Alabama, with a long epigraph from Michael McClure. In this world, the problems seep into me when there are silver stars on black velvet. This is followed by brown fog and auto sounds, and the sounds of police cars driving into lines of protesters. When the cuffs are on, it's game over, says my brother the cop, but it didn't stop. The knee ended the life of George Floyd. The problems of empire's maintenance seep into you as you say it, as I say it, in gray fog aching for a turning point. So these last um, couple of poems are directly come out of Michael McClure, my latest series. I write in projects. I don't write 
Well, I write some occasional poems, but my main practice is writing seri uh, serial form. So I won't write one or two poems. I'll write 50 or 60. And I've been, the latest one is from uh, Michael McClure's book, Touching the Edge, Dharma Devotions from the Hummingbird Sangha. McClure, by the way, and Ginsburg were both opened in Subwood. So I like to believe that I got a little taste of the Latihan through them, or maybe they made it possible for my spirit to be seeking Subwood and the Latihan. Um, but I took a line from one of these McClure poems and I've, I've run with it. So I'm going to read the poem that I got from Michael and that, that really propelled me. Um, number 42 in this book, flexible mind flows over itself, admiring the details and pliantly forgetting. The straight back holds everything higher than an anemone growing above redwood roots, greed, hatred, and ignorance rise up at midnight like the morning. Wisdom is calm readiness, buried under mildewed briefcases and archives of knowledge. Because the brain will not orchestrate understanding, a black branch in front of the moon is better. So from December 8th last year, flexible mind knows the other authority here is the dailiness, as Fred Wass said, and the new day gets here with quickening velocity, fast as a cloud life. Flexible eyes learn to watch. Flexible ear hears it. Dying mosquito, howling dog, screaming man, as the self-same sound of distress. The new day gets here, the new water, the new matcha latte, the new pancake, the new sashimi, the new syllables, the old dreams, habits, fantasies, all waiting for the ageless nothing below everything. And from January 1st, flexible breaths, not a matter of will, but biology. As you change the signature of the breath, you fix the self more closely with the infinite openness lying at the ground of the present. The same ground crows plow, looking for lunch. The same ground the fish in the grebe's beak was swimming toward, as we all are, carrying our cell phones and wounds, personal myths and scratch tickets, whose outmoded nature can be flushed with a real breath. This is all biology, as Michael knew and showed us one whiff of cinnamon at a time. And then this last poem from the series um, was written, I think yesterday, maybe the day before, oh, March 4th, yesterday. Yeah, seems like a long time ago. For Tokoshinoda, who lived to age 107, and was a master calligrapher who uh, got to New York during the height of abstract expressionism and hung out with de Kooning and Motherwell and all the abstract expressionists who she would say later were um, very accommodating. They were, they were very, um, they were, they were great colleagues and very generous. I forget the word she used. There's a New York times article about her life and lived to 107. Holy shit. So um, that's who Toko Shinoda is. And I can share some of her work. I have it pulled up. And if I share screen, maybe in the Q&A, I could share it. And this would be my last poem. Local flexible minds, a wholly owned subsidiary of non-local mind, a division of the patience project, whose rituals include rescuing or burying hummingbirds, raising two single children, admiring and savoring the speed limit and letting the lake guide your control paws. The water at any time, capable of hypnosis, capable of returning you to the endless, endlessly flexible launch realm of black plasma and imagination, festoons all this planning, these intricate, endless bylaws discussions that stand in the way of Kaze no Mori and Hamachi Kama, Peace, Toko Shinoda, 107 years of abstract 
elegance sudden as a mountain rainstorm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That's incredible stuff, as usual. And uh, I'm particularly uh, enchanted with uh, you uh, getting the term bylaws discussions. Written in the <laughs> you have to have the, 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 the luminous details, right? The abstract, the, the, not the abstractions, but the absolute specific things. And when I say that, anyone who has dealt with them knows exactly the tedium and the necessary nature of what I'm talking about. So it's interesting. Thanks for picking up on that. Uh, well, I'm sure I, everybody has picked up on different things. So we're going to move into the next uh, phase of our uh, Zoom Use event. And this is where we get to interact with Paul and ask him questions. If you'd like to raise your hand, I'm going to go first to Hamilton Schaefitz. So Hamilton, just uh, ra um, unmute yourself and then go. Thank you for today, Paul. Um, it was a, a roller coaster ride from... Uh, one uh, vista to the next. So my question is, have you published American postcards? I had a book deal to publish them and then it kind of fell apart. And I kind of felt it was okay for it to fall apart because um, my postcard practice um, did not include the visual as a real integrated component before last year. It was a, f a few poems in the last year that I thought, I'm gonna write the poem, then I'm gonna do a collage for the image. And now they're a lot more integrated. And my work is difficult um, to begin with. So to have a postcard image that's really not related or was done in advance, no matter how creative, um, it didn't seem right to me. So it seems a lot better now. And no, the answer, I, I haven't yet to publish postcard poems, but. I've written over a thousand of them, so I've got a lot to choose from. Well, I, I think they're really astounding. And even without images, um, I think they uh, could bring a smile to people. Um, they certainly have done that for me and uh, belly laughs. So thank you for today. My, my pleasure, brother. Um, hope you're feeling okay. I would encourage anybody anyone interested in postcard poetry to go to popo.cards. I'll put, I'll put it in the chat and sign up for our postcard fest. It's a gas. Try that. Thank you, Hamilton. So we'll move on to the next person. Anybody want to wave their hand at me and uh, say something? Uh, Marcus Bolt, unmute yourself and then go. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much for that. It was, just moving, entertaining. It was terrific. And um, what struck me was you, you are such a wordsmith, such a brilliant presenter as well. And um, if anyone asks me to define the word wordsmith, I'll say Paul Nelson from now on. <laughs> and, uh, it was really great. In fact, at times, um, and this is it, it meant to be a, a compliment, <laughs> at times I found it difficult to know when your conversation, your normal conversation had come to an end and the poem had begun and vice versa. Yeah, it was there's just something about the way you are with words that really impresses me. <laughs> and I really appreciate that, yeah. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say was I, I once saw um, Allen Ginsberg performing live at the Royal Albert Hall in London. And that was pretty astounding and uh, I was going to mention that uh, they had a, a, an extraordinary program on British TV about the relationship between Ginsburg and um, uh, Kerouac. And um, I did some research after and I was astounded to read an interview with Ginsburg about being in Seward. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And you obviously knew him well. No, no, I didn't know him well. I only met him once, but I would love to see Alan talking about Latihan. That would be an amazing piece to see. I know that Michael wrote about it in his uh, Meet Science Essays, an essay called Reason, and it's the best description of uh, people doing Latihan I've ever seen. It was written in the early 60s, and last time I talked about how I think McClure's being opened in Subud opened him up to 
um, the beast language that he did. And I talked about that last time. But if you have access to that Ginsburg talking about Subwood, I would love to see it. And of course, that that Albert Hall reading was legendary. So for you to have been there is uh, is really remarkable. And thank you for That's your kind right. words. Yes, yes. It was um, a bit like, in one way, a kind of reflection of uh, when someone shouted out um, traitor or something in, uh, in the Bob Dylan concert when he first went electrical. And yeah, someone in the audience after Ginsberg had done a, a series of what he called sound poetry, someone in the audience shouted out, give us some poetry. And there was a kind of riot <laughs> unheard of in the, the Royal Albert Hall. <laughs> well, now we know how many holes it takes to fill that place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Yeah, well, anyway, Paul, thank you so much. I, that was so enjoyable. I mean, it, just on every level, thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother. Thank you, Marcus. Would somebody else like to say something or ask a question? Cecilia Wadi, unmute yourself and go. Paul, it's so great to hear you. I love the lyricism in your reading. And, and I think that comes from who you are, but also having been in radio and so forth and being a poet. It's a beautiful combination. Um, and I love the way American members pronounce the word Latihan. I can't do it, but there's a certain auditory tweak that we don't have here in Canada. And um, it, it's, it's pervasive amongst the born and raised and opened members in Subud in the USA. And the things, the way, um, one of the things that really struck me, Paul, was the line, and Johnny rebuilt the barn. That was something that really made me feel like an inner triumph, you know? And also um, the bit about Donald Trump uh, being sworn in on carpet samples. I, I just thought that was amazing. And also um, um, oh, I can't remember now. But those are the three things that uh, really touched me. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia Wati. Um, the Japanese people had, a, had an expression. It's the title of one of the poems in the book. Ikito koto wa shikata ga nai. And it's, um, it's translated to what has been done can't be helped. So there's an acceptance to it. Japanese people would probably say sometimes to a fault, right? But that was their motto um, from what I could tell during the internment of World War II, which happened also in Canada of and course. which Marlet, you know, wrote about in Steveston. And so, uh, um, you know, what can't, what has been done can't be helped. We have to go along with it. And, this level of acceptance is a real model and it's something I would like to strive for and something I think Buddhism and Latihan can help us achieve that to really understand that, um, you know, in, in Suba terms, you might say it's, uh, it's God's will or divine will that these kinds of things happen, but also to make sure you do what you need to do to be able to survive such a thing. So creating art in the concentration camps uh, internment camps, creating gardens and all that thing was part of their experience. But I read that poem in Walla Walla at the Walla Walla Poetry Festival. I'll never forget it. Dennis Mayer, who speaks Chinese and translates Chinese poets, you know, I, and I, I finished that with, and Johnny rebuilt the barn and he stands up and goes, yes, like that. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, that's as close to a fuck you as you're going to get to a, from a Japanese person. And it's like, you know what, you did this, you're terrorists. We know that my cows are dead. I'm, you know, I'm sick with grief, but I'm rebuilding the barn. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a new incident of incidents uh, rise in the number of hate crimes. There was a, a woman 
in her 70s, because she was Asian in the international district here in Seattle, you know, quote unquote, progressive Seattle, some person put a rock in a sock, hit her in the face, fractured her cheek, and she lost several teeth because of this. Why? The crime of being Asian. So you see what carnage Trump and Trumpism has uh, unleashed and has also um, ha unveiled. It's always been there, but now it's more, more out in the open. And um, it's time not so much to be anti-racist, but to be pro-human and pro-human rights and to um, and to oppose these kinds of things and to call them out and see that justice is met. So thank you for picking up on that. I love that line too. And, and I always think of Dennis saying, yes, Johnny rebuilt the burn. Take that, you sons of bitches. <laughs> okay, thank you, Paul. So would somebody else like to speak next? Let me go to the second screen and see if anybody's got their hands up here. Yeah, I just... Am I in, you can hear me? We can hear you now, go ahead. Good. I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed your reading, Paul. That was wonderful. And it's, I don't often get an opportunity to hear you reading from different time periods in your writing. And I wanted, wanted to know if you wanted to speak to, there's a practice that's emerged from your influences with McClure and with Ginsburg and how it's turned into a daily practice and I, I wondered if you wanted to speak to that a little bit more in terms of how you think it's changed you and how your practice has changed. Because I'm certainly noticing the progression in your writing and really delighting in it. And I just wondered if what you could say around that seriality, the daily practice, um, whatever you think going forward is gonna be useful for, for people to hear. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adelia. Well, um... That's really nice for you to say that and recognize that. I don't really think much about that, but I guess it can be obvious um, if, you, if you look at the earlier work and see the later work, maybe it's more subtle, maybe it's more interested in individuated, maybe it's, it's more individuated work. But Michael said something in that book, Three Poems, which I talked about last time. Uh, there was a line, if poetry and science cannot change one's life, they're meaningless. So how do we use the act of being a poet, of writing poetry, to learn more about how we think and to learn more about our deeper self. Um, and, you know, I think poetry alone could probably do it, but it helps that I have a sometimes yoga practice. It helps that I do Latihan twice a week and many other things. It helps that I draw a rune every day. Today I got the rune of joy, Wunyo, which is beautiful. So, um, and, and writing every day helps. I journal every day and um, I, I see that the journaling is important, but I also see, see it giving way eventually to a daily practice of just writing all those experiences in a poem. Jose Coser in that case is a, is a model for me, who writes a poem or two every day, puts it away, goes about his day, watches you know foreign movies, reads foreign novels or whatever, and then the next day he looks at it, he makes a couple of adjustments, and then he's done with it. He moves on to the next thing. And so his book of collected poems that came out, I don't know, five or six years ago, is like <laughs> that thick with a DVD in it that's even more. So um, Bill Ransom's, uh, his writing theory is keep writing, it gets better. And I think that's true with anything. The more you do it, the, the better you're going to get at it, providing that, you know, you have a community, you have a sangha that you're going to share with, and they're going to hold you accountable for, uh, you know, not writing the same poem over and over and over and over. And I think having serial form um, allows you to, ex to express your own personal myth, to evolve your own personal myth, and to see how your personal myth evolves in the different subjects you choose to do a saturation job on. So I think those are some of the ways I'd respond to the question, but um, I don't know, maybe I didn't get to it. That's what I would say now. No, I think you covered it a lot. I was just trying to weave together the, the traditions that you're coming from and how you built on them. And um, just, yeah, I, th I think you covered it all there. It's, it's hard to put into a few words, I know. Um, but thank you. This was really, I really enjoyed the reading today. So Thank you, Delia. Did you get Theo? Um, Theo, Theo had, uh, it's, it said he raised his hand, Andrew. I'm wondering if uh, he's ready to say, to ask. Uh, yeah, a couple of comments, Paul. Um, Hamilton had a word uh, or a phrase uh, that, that, that struck me in describing your poetry. It's like a roller coaster. 
the word that had come to me was propulsive. It felt very propulsive. And I noticed, in, at least in the first two poems, there were these powerful repetitions. I don't remember what it was in the second poem now, but in the first one, it was the phrase, get out. Boy, that had a lot of power to it. And, uh, and the way you vocalized it, you know, was very effective. Um, and, and I want to say, I think you disproved some of what uh, Andrew, some of the characterization Andrew made of you, but not that you're quintessentially American. I think you are. That came through to me very strongly. And, and, and being such, I hope I know what that means, but uh, that's how you strike me. Um, kind, of, kind of irreverent in a, as part of it, kind of willing to say what other people might not want to say just because it seems uh, impolite or something like that and just put it out there and uh, let people make of it what they will, even if they find it a little hard to swallow, maybe that act of swallowing something that's hard to swallow will help uh, wake them up or make them bigger inside, you know? Uh, I don't know if that's making any sense or not. Um, but anyway, I, I enjoyed all of it. And it's a, it's a different kind of poetry from what I'm used to. I have not explored modern poetry much. I think my interest stopped roughly with William Butler Yeats uh, um, and uh, maybe one or two more recent ones, but uh, I, I love your stuff and I think I've got to get at least one of your books and read it because I think that your poetry works at many levels, I suspect. And to me, the best poetry should do that and you can't get it all in one hearing, you know. Right. So anyway, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, I enjoyed it a whole lot. Thank you for that. M Michael McClure uses the term myriad minded. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's a good word to use and working on different levels and having a lot of subjects and being a piece of work that you can go back to 10 years later and get something totally different out of it. That's the work to which I aspire. And um, regarding the roller coaster comment, I just think that it's a roller coaster of love. Say what? <laughs> well, it's certainly the roller coaster of life. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's a lot to it. You know, it's hard to, it's hard for me to write anthology poems where here's a poem about bread and it's 14 lines and it's all about bread. I tend to, I tend to meander. Um, I see there was a question about Lawrence Ferlinghetti and of course he's a legend. He uh, started City Lights Books. He defended Allen Ginsberg uh, with uh, the poem Howl, which became a, you know, a, a censorship battle, which uh, the good guys won. And so <clears throat> the passing of Ferland Getty at 101, almost 102, is a, a real moment, <clears throat> a real moment in time. Yeah, that just happened. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a, it really is really an end of, end of an era. And he lived in a time when San Francisco was an affordable place to live. And uh, now look at it. You can't live there. It's, it's, a, it's capitalism. Even the tech bros are now moving out because they've – They've ruined it in many ways. And Seattle is in many ways is turning into San Francisco 2.0. So it'll be interesting to see how these places evolve and how what will be the center of creativity. Does the Internet allow us to have uh, centers that are not, you know, in one place, but are connected via affinity groups through Zoom? Who knows? But. I, I somehow like the idea that people locally can support each other, can be a sangha, and uh, I would love it if Subud uh, centers were the nexus, uh, uh, where each was the nexus of that kind of creativity. And I believe that the potential is there, and Sika USA uh, is working to create that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful for that. Oh, I want to add just one comment. I really liked American sentences. And someone singled out about the one about uh, Trump, uh, I want to say taking his vow, but that's not the phrase, on a, on a uh, st stack of carpet samples. That, it, that really captured something along the lines of what you were just saying. Yeah, so news thank you again. You're welcome, Theo. Thank you for appreciating me. That news thump is, a, is, a, is an onion-like source. So there, 
their satire site. And when they said that he was to be sworn in on a book of carpet samples, I just thought, let me write that down right now. <laughs> you got to write it down. You carry a little book on you and you write the stuff down, you know, and, and, uh, and then mm. it's hard to harvest them. I just went through six years of American sentences. I should have put all the Latihan ones in a, in a file, but I'm like, I'm worried about the ones that are getting in the book, but now I have to, I would have to go back through them and get all the Latihan ones because there's many that only Suba people would understand. And so they weren't really for a general audience, but I did include one in the reading and that one will be in the book. And that was um, about, uh, let me see if I can go back to my, my notes here and see if I can find that one. Um, it was octogenarians Latihan sounds like practice to be a ghost. <laughs> you know, that's uh, almost there. Uh, well, well, are we all January 5th, 2020? So this was very late in the pre-lockdown time. And, uh, you know, it struck me as uh, I think it's all practice to be a ghost, right? You know, Eileen Miles yeah. said life is a dress rehearsal for the poem. And, <laughs> you know, life is also a dress rehearsal for the for the afterlife in a way. So um, interesting to have that moment come to me. Andrew, do you think that's our show for today? Um, unless Lydia, you, unless Lydia wave. Jump in. Uh, any raised hands there, folks? Lydia, was that? Did, she had a hand up. Yeah, yeah when you, Lydia, unmute yourself, please, and you can go. Devil of me, I'm telling you. Um, I just wanted to say a, a thank you to you because I'm not familiar with you nor your work. And um, it's really quite thrilling to be uh, listening to somebody who. Um, is on that wavelength, the Ginsburg, the whole thing, you know? Um, I, I operate more on a, I guess, a, a personal level. I don't know if you're familiar with HD's poetry, but um, the little small um, examples from life. And uh, today I've had a rotten day. And so I totally connected when you said, in a gray fog, aching for a turning point. So thank you for that line. If that's all I can do is thank you for one line because the rest is, beyond my uh, capacity. But thanks for that one line. I got it. Thanks, Lydia. Thanks, thanks for your kind thanks, comments, thanks, Lydia. And I'll just go around and have a quick glue. Anybody? Oh, Latifa would like to say something. Go ahead, Latifa. Just unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Paul. I totally loved it. And all of the awful stuff and the good stuff and everything together it was fabulous. Yet again. Thank you, Latifa. Thanks, Latifa. And uh, Marcus, are you waving goodbye or do you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, just, just a quickie. I just also just remembered um, when I was researching uh, the Ginsburg um, Kerouac thing, I came across um, a postcard that Kerouac sent to Ginsburg. I think. He mentioned Hyatt Ashbury, but I can't remember. He said, I'm leaving Hyatt Ashbury for the summer to get away from the suburb crazies. <laughs> really made me laugh. I did. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that. I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> nice that, uh, <laughs> Lily um, has her hand up. I just I just want to thank you. I, I found you through Ian Boyden, um, writing some musical poems based on um, his poetry for the spirit children of Sichuan. That's what I call them. And uh, listen, I, I just I'm just really in love with what you're doing. And I also just want to say that when I I had a beat older sister and when I read Howl when I was eight, I just blew my mind so much. And I wound up writing a play that my elementary school let me direct it and produce it. I can't believe it. To the, I, I don't have the script for it. I sure wish I did. But anyway, so everything about your poetry and what you're connected to in so many ways, it was just fabulous. Thank you so, so much. Thanks, really Lily, for popping in. I love Ian, and I love that project of his, A Forest of Names. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much there. Um, Paul, I just wanted to, if it's the power of the poem or if it's just because it's something in me that resonated, but the one in Before Slaughter, which was about the indigenous folks, 
for some reason that was like getting whacked by a two by four. I, uh, uh, and I had this pang of sort of guilt that I should have given a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our meeting. Well, I did in part talk about the Tuxwukwib watershed and the Duwamish people and, you know, everything is an homage to those people on whose ancestral homeland we're operating here. So, um, you know, everything is an homage to the indigenous people and a settler culture will never be at ease until we listen to indigenous people and learn how to be indigenous to here. So the, the time is now for, for it, the time was 25 years ago for me to understand that. And I think the time is now for settler culture to realize that, to stop its childish wars, its war against the biosphere, its war against people of color and women and children and immigrant children grow up. It's time to grow up and listen to indigenous people and understand what it takes to live here in sync with here and about here and be expressions of here, wherever here is for you. For, for me, here is Cascadia and everybody has their own here and uh, someday we'll get it right. I'm optimistic. Thank you. Um, so um, are there any further thoughts that you'd like to sort of share before we um, sign off and wave goodbye? I'm grateful for you, Andrew. You're stewarding this in a in completely impeccable and professional way. And I'm very grateful for that. It's very much a, an honoring of me and my work. And to have this kind of a forum is a rare thing and a beautiful thing. And I'm really grateful for it. Grateful for Subud. Grateful that many people from my workshops popped in to, uh, to see if I could back up what I'm talking about in the class. I hope I did. And uh, I love those people. They're energizing and I, I love being able to facilitate those workshops and if anyone wants more information on that they can uh, send me a send me a line paulenelson.com okay well that's wonderful and you do have a workshop coming up i think in april or uh, is that is yeah that april sundays in april a sequence of energies and we still have room in that workshop for folks and and uh, um linda thanks for your kind comments that's very sweet very sweet. Oh, it was really good to hear you again, hear you read again. And it's just, uh, if, if anybody is thinking he's a wonderful poet, boy, you should see him as a teacher. He's, uh, these classes you've been doing have just been wonderful. Thanks, Linda. Thank did you see week one for the next uh, workshop? I did, did yes. I'm already delving in. <laughs> I added a, um, a workshop exercise handout for ekphrastic poem exercise so i just did that finished that this morning so i put that on as a link okay. and i went through the book the ekphrastic uh, book transforming vision edward hirsch and uh, so that's now an exercise and um it's fun to do these uh these workshop handouts i, I did one on the death poems which is in there yeah i saw then, that and this comes from the art institute of chicago so there's a great piece on American Gothic in here, highly recommended um, by Guy Davenport. It's, I think it's the best piece in the book, but it's prose. It's not poetry. So um, anyway, that's that was one of my sources for the piece. So, yeah, so it'll be in week one. And I'm giving people, since they already registered, it's like, have at it. So you can go through it because I loaded a lot of shit in there again. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see where people go with it. Always an adventure. Thanks, Linda. You take care. All right, you I, too. I got to uh, run because somebody's upstairs visiting and I should probably go and see who it is. Well, you gotta, yeah. I love getting that that Ginsburg talking about Latihan interview. I, I made a copy of that and I really want to see it. I mean, I, I suspect it'll be a CUSA post before too long, but, um, you know, I, it was, I interviewed Alan before it was open, so... And like I say, maybe because he was open and McClure was opened, that my soul was like ready for Latihan. I think things work that way, you know? I mean, they say, what is the old saying? When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And uh, damn, if Latihan ain't a lot like um, projective verse, you know? Uh, he, uh, also called projective verse, the use of speech at its least careless and least logical. And... That sure sounds like Latihan to me. So 
I'll uh, I'll see you all hopefully soon. Maybe I I hope that we'll, I'll get to see my Subud brothers and sisters uh, at a real live Subud event before too long. I'd like to do a cultural congress some year. I'm hoping by the end of my before the end of my term that we can do something at Susanna Rosenthal's place near Muncie, Indiana. Um, that would be outstanding to have a cultural congress and share practices and have an experience of culture. If anyone's not ever done any testing on culture, it's powerful, powerful. And uh, to have people doing workshops based on allowing us the experience of culture as from a Seward perspective, that would be a remarkable thing. So I'm hoping I can manifest that or the, the SICA board uh, can manifest that because it's, um, it's a great board that's uh, emerging from um, for SICA USA, which is a really nice feeling. Um, a pleasure to thank Paul on behalf of everybody and to uh, say hello to all the new folks who uh, have come along because of Paul and your connection. Um, it's, uh, he has a wonderful gift and he's nurtured it and applied himself and uh, I'm, in, uh, I'm in awe, quite frankly. Um, so I, he's, I value him very much as a Subu brother. So I'm, unless somebody has something they wanna say now, uh, we're gonna wave goodbye and uh, there we go. Take care folks. Bye Paul, wonderful having you, thank, thank you. you.